So, um, ah, there is a microphone here, so I, I am supposed to be here, probably. Um, so, let's, uh, uh, how many of you know what Misra is? A lot of people, which is good. Okay, so basically for those uh, that don't know what Misra is, uh, it's an organization and that uh, focuses on uh, providing best practices for safety-related development, safety and security-related development. Uh, the most famous uh, outcome of this uh, group uh, are the MISRA C coding standard, the MISRA C++ coding standard, and uh, concerning MISRA C and MISRA C++, what uh, everybody should know before I start is that they are coding guidelines. So they are sets of coding guidelines. They say, okay, if you use C or if you use C++, at least uh, don't do this. Or if you do this, you have to realize that there is this uh, potential issue and you should take care of them. For example, very simple rule is an advisory rule. It says, don't use GoTo. You may decide to use GoTo, but there is another rule which is required as opposed to be only advisory, which says, well, if you use GATU, at least do not jump backwards, because if you jump backwards, you risk introducing loops that are very difficult to diagnose if they are unwanted. Or if you use GATUs, please do not jump inside the block from outside the block, because there are certain risks associated. Now, uh, the MISRA coding standards uh, are indirectly referred to by the functional safety coding standard in the part where they say that you should use a safe subset of a standardized language. C and C++, they are standardized by ISO and they have many features that are dangerous for different reasons and so MISRA C and MISRA C++ are the most uh, authoritative uh, subsets of C and C++. Um, so the greatest benefits from applying the MISRA coding standard is uh, if you uh, adopt them from day zero in your project. You start coding with the MISRA coding standard enforced uh, by, by a tool automatically and, uh, and you don't accumulate any backlog uh, maybe with thousands or hundreds of thousands of violations. And this is often not possible for various reasons which are well known. And one reason is that it is becoming more and more common to incorporate open source software into critical system. And uh, you incorporate open source software once the open source software already exists and it has proven its value. So it's existing by definition. And uh, virtually every time, it will not have been written with the MISRA coding standards in mind. So why, why uh, is people thinking, or actually they have already started, incorporating open source software in critical system to have access to innovative technologies and products, to avoid vendor lock-in, to leverage the existing communities uh, uh, and ecosystem, and this, of course, would allow for cost reduction and shorter development cycles, even though uh, adopting open source software as a cost, of course. And the lower layers in a software stack are particularly suited to this move. And um, I mention uh, projects uh, in which uh, I have been uh, involved to some extent. So Trusted Firmware uh, is a uh, uh, enforcing MISRA compliance uh, into their projects and the XEN project hypervisor uh, also it's uh, the project uh, that gave rise to the uh, presentation I'm, I'm doing now. Uh, the Zephyr real-time operating system as a coding standard which is largely based uh, on a good portion of MISRA C and ELISA ELISA, it's uh, in a different realm, so I don't think they are thinking about uh, MISRA in, in, any, in any way, but still the target of the ELISA project is to enable the use of uh, uh, Linux in critical system, in safety critical system. So there are challenges in safety qualification of open source software. Safety qualification means uh, 
Well, the functional safety standards say you, you simply don't go and download the software. You have to qualify it, okay? You have to, in a way, prove its adequacy from the point of view of safety. So there are challenges. So the, the most important challenges are that uh, you need processes. Uh, this is not to mean that open source software doesn't have processes. Uh, some of them have very good processes. For example, the Xen hypervisor, very good and strict processes for uh, accepting patches, for applying them, for deciding uh, what goes into a release and when it goes into a release and so on. But simply, uh, this processor, uh, these processes are not complete or, or they are not in line with what functional safety standards demand. For example, the technical safety concept is typically skipped, formal inspections are not conducted and so on. Then there is typically a problem with artifacts, and many of them are missing. For example, requirements are typically missing. So the Zephyr project is now investing a lot of energies into uh, retrofitting requirements, so, and also tests are missing, particularly unit tests. Okay? Uh, these uh, are uh, both requirements and tests are very expensive to develop, and uh, when they are missing, basically you have to produce them. And governance is another uh, important point. So open source projects are based largely on volunteer work, and only part of the community may care about uh, functional safety qualification. The rest of the community might be not so interested and may even uh, see this as uh, an obstacle uh, for the advancement of the project. Uh, another challenge is high configurability. So, um, and typically you want to safety qualify only a small subset and not uh, the, its entirety. You want to safety qualify only a certain specific configuration because it will cost a lot of money. So we are talking about, uh, I don't know, hundreds to thousands of requirements to be developed and we are talking about tens of thousands or, or even more of tests to be developed. So you will typically only want to safety qualify a small subject and how do you define it and how do you deal with the common code and part of the common code may be uh, um, assigned to maintainers who couldn't care less about safety qualification and so on. And pace of development is another issue. So many open source projects are very quick and maintaining uh, up to date all the safety artifacts uh, is, can be very challenging. And also there are some cultural differences. For example, a virtuoso programming attitude, which is common in open source project, whereas uh, safety uh, code involved in safety related project has to be boring. It has to be absolutely boring. It has to be obvious what it does. It, it shouldn't take uh, a, a, a virtuoso of C programming to understand it because all the time you waste in thinking that yes, here there are two post increments and one pre decrement plus double pointer in direction, but after 30 minutes, I realize it's correct. Well, you will spend this, you or someone else or the assessor will spend those 30 minutes again and again. And all this is time that is better devoted to getting the logic right. Okay, you cannot spend time to understand the virtuoso thing. You want the code to be boring. And this is a, frequently, this is one of a problem when dealing with uh, some part of the open source uh, community. So there are uh, several possibilities uh, which are not mutually exclusive. One is retrofitting safety. So you have maybe to create the requirements if they didn't exist or adapt them make them traceable, and then adopt and enforce a suitable coding standard. Despite what I said before, for example, you may adopt at a late stage in the project MISRA C. So you will start with talking about Xen, half a million of violations that now we have managed to cut down by 97%, I think, okay? And, and, 
And uh, another possibility is forking. So this is not suitable if code is not fit for purpose yet. So, but in the final phases of certification, this might be inevitable. Uh, when you remain with, uh, the, with few but very hard issues and you have uh, a timeline to honor because, uh, I don't know, because you have uh, uh, the assessor uh, evaluating the project at a certain date, in the end you will be, I think, forced to fork. And another possibility is to refrain from safety qualification. So uh, you may decide to qualify only a small component that monitors uh, the correct behavior of the rest. So uh, all the functional safety standards uh, concur on the fact that software, critical software, safety critical software, has to be traceable to documented requirements. And here I connect to the, to the talks we had before on Basil and verifiable and verified by means of peer review, static and dynamic analysis and testing. So use of C and C++ is allowed uh, according to the functional safety standard, uh, pro um, be provided that they are standardized, which means you have to use the standardized languages. So there are MISRA guidelines saying, hey, you don't use ext uh, extensions or you limit the use of extension very much. And for each extension, you provide a motivation and you, have to be, you will have to qualify the compiler by yourself. Programs have a well-defined semantics, so you should eradicate undefined and unspecified behavior. And both C and C++, and for that matter, even Rust, has a lot of uh, undefined behaviors. Uh, you have to qualify your translators because uh, having the code uh, well correct and having the compiler miscompiling it, of course, uh, is, uh, is, not, is not useful. So you have to qualify the compiler. Programs refrain from using error prone or difficult to understand constructs because uh, you have to place reliance on peer review. And so code has to be readable. And also, program units, uh, for example, functions or methods, are of limited complexity. So MISRA C and MISRA C++ address all these concerns one way or another. Now, let's uh, 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 continue with an important distinction. So MISRA has this notion of adopted code. And adopted code is as a technical meaning, and it's difficult, it's, it's different from code that is simply existing. So adopted code is fit for purpose as is, and need not be read, understood, or modified. And for this, there is simplified MISA compliance. So one typical example of adopted code is the implementation of the language standard library. This is adopted code. Nobody has to read the implementation of the C standard library. Everybody needs to read the do documentation and the specification for the functions provided by the standard library. But this is adopted code, and you need not, uh, you need not uh, uh, read it, understand it, or modify it. Whereas when code is simply existing, but oh, but this is exists already. This is not an excuse for skipping. MISRA compliance, and actually the process is exactly the same. There is no uh, simplification. Okay, so uh, said that, MISRA, what happened? <laughs> MISRA has been conceived uh, in a way that is very pragmatic. So first of all, the guidelines never say, OK, there are some mandatory guidelines, guidelines that you cannot avoid because they are directly tied to undefined behavior. So you have a variable on the stack. You don't initialize it. You don't write to it. And you read it. This is undefined behavior. There is a mandatory guideline that says you don't do it, OK, because you have no guarantee whatsoever about what can happen. But the, there are only, uh, say, I don't know, now, maybe 15 out of 200 MISRA guidelines that are mandatory. The others are 
uh, required or advisory, and they can be deviated. So they don't say, you don't do this. They say, hey, this is dangerous. You may do it, provided it is needed, provided it is safe, and provided you can explain to your colleague in 30 seconds that is both needed and safe. That is the spirit of miserable. So you can violate guidelines with justification. You can tailor them also. Okay. Uh, I don't know, this was not the right button. Okay. And Misra makes it very clear, uh, despite common misconceptions. So there are, I am a member of the Misra C working group, and so I know that there are a lot of misconceptions concerning Misra. One of them is, I have this rule, these rules are, are tying my hands. I cannot program with this. Okay. And no, this is not true, because Misra says in writing that code quality always comes first. So if you have an argument that violating the guideline improves code quality, any attribute of code quality, whether it is maintainability, testability, execution speed, whatever, you are actually encouraged to violate the guideline. Okay, you are not doing Misra compliance properly if you don't violate the guideline in the case where where you should. So tailoring of the MESRA guideline is essentially, especially for existing, for existing software. Uh, of course, you can select uh, the non-mandatory guidelines to comply with. You can have global deviation for required guidelines where this is justifiable, and you can have partial deviation for required guidelines to adapt them to the project. And doing this is essential for a success, especially if the code is already existing. Now, let me give you a little bit of introduction to the Xen hypervisor. I, I, I'm not the right person. Uh, Stefano Stabellini should, should be here to do this part of the presentation. So Xen is a type one hypervisor with a microkernel design. It's uh, an open source project. It was established, uh, I think, 15 years ago. And the license is GPL version two. Uh, uh, ARM and x86 uh, are fully supported. Uh, um, um, the support for RISC-V is uh, in progress, and uh, it has uh, several uh, uh, features uh, that are extremely interesting for embedded systems, and in particular for safety-critical embedded systems, in particular real-time and cache isolation in software. Uh, static partitioning, freedom from interference, a terminology that comes from ISO 26262, and the support for uh, multiprocessor systems. So given that Xen runs independently at a, at a higher privileged mode, it is uh, both essential in achieving isolation, independence, freedom from interference, and the same concept, more or less the same concept, is call it differently in uh, the different functional safety standard. Basically, it is the idea that uh, a defect or a crash in one component should not uh, crash another component in the system. They should be isolated, okay? And especially if one is, uh, uh, has low criticality and it causes the crashing of a high criticality function. So you don't want a crash, I don't know, in your in your uh, infotainment system to cause a crash in the airbag system. Of course, this is uh, unbelievable, and, and uh, you have to prove that this uh, cannot happen, and there are many ways in which it can happen. So uh, if you use Xen in this way, Xen becomes one of the most critical uh, components in a system, and so it has to be qualified uh, for safety-related use. And Bugsang, the company I, I co-founded, is working since more than one year, I think it's one year and a half, uh, um, on a project funded by AMD to achieve MISRA compliance of select design configuration for x86-64 and ARM64 uh, architectures. And we have done really a lot, a lot of progress. Um, so um, I present some examples uh, of uh, uh, the things that you need to do when you, uh, when you want to comply uh, with, function, with the MISRA C and the code is already existing. And uh, I thought I had here. So I need, uh, I need to give you an idea of what a certain... So this is MISRA, okay? 
This Misra C is a version of Misra C. Uh, you are seeing on screen one rule, and that I will mention briefly in the presentation. It's rule 10.1. It says, operands shall not be of an inappropriate essential type, which means nothing, but it is connected to unspecified behaviors, implementation defined behaviors, and undefined behaviors of basically all versions of the C of the C standard. So uh, C11 and C18 are not here, but they are equally affected because I, I've chosen a version of Misra C, which is the one that is being enforced by Xen. Okay, there is a new version, Misra C 2023, where, uh, where you also have C11, C18, and, and so on. And so uh, this rule says, that for each uh, that you should comply, you should behave, you should program as if the C, the C language had a much stronger type system than it has. So you have to treat Boolean data as Boolean, characters as characters, small integers and, uh, differently from whether they are signed or unsigned, and so on. And so rule 10.1 for each of the operator will tell you what you can do and what you cannot do. You can always deviate because you see this rule, it's required, it's written here. It's not mandatory, so you can deviate with the reason. So this table has all the operators and uh, it has all the essential types. The essential types are, uh, yeah, types defined by, by, uh, by Misra C, according to the nature of the data, okay? So it says, for example, that as uh, the index of an array uh, indexing operation, you cannot use a Boolean, and the reason is given in footnote number three. And you cannot use a character, but you can use a num uh, signed and unsigned, and, and you can tell this because the, the cell is empty. And of course, you cannot use a floating point to address an array, okay? Uh, other examples, uh, you cannot add two booleans together. So the compiler will say nothing, but doesn't make any sense, so you, you don't do it. And uh, you shouldn't add an enumerated type because what you end up with is something that may be outside the range of the enumerated type and so on. And uh, so this rules, uh, uh, this table continues here, uh, what you can do with the shift operators and what you cannot do, and the rationale for this rule, the, it's, it's a rule that has multiple rationale, and now I can, now I can, if I manage, I can go back to the original uh, presentation, which is here. It has multiple rationale. So it is, some uh, of the, Prescriptions are to avoid implementation defined behavior, others are to uh, uh, avoid undefined behavior, and either uh, are to uh, avoid so called developer confusion. You are addressing an array with a Boolean. Did you really mean this? Was it a typo? Maybe you wrote X and you want to write Y. You, the variable name is not the right variable. Or maybe you really wanted to take the first element of the array if the variable was false, and the second if it was true, but then why don't do this explicitly? So it's different rationale. Um, so there are things which are normally violations uh, of rule 10.1, which are safe, and some of them uh, they are very much used, both in Xen and, and in other existing uh, software. For example, value-preserving conversions of integer constant, they are safe, okay? So you are assigning to an unsigned integer, and you are assigning the value 27. Well, 27, if you write it like this, is a signed integer. However, the conversion is safe, so 27, can be represented as an unsigned integer, so it's safe, okay? Shifting non-negative integers to the right, uh, well, 
it's not a problem because the standard guarantees that the uh, representation used for uh, numbers without, which are non-negative uh, is positional base two. So there is no implementation defined behavior associated to whether integers uh, are represented in uh, two complement, one complement, or sinic magnitude. It's, that it's the same, okay? Uh, Bitwise logical operation on negative integer, uh, even if the operands are of sine type, they are fine because the sine bit is zero. So there is not this uncertainty about how the bitwise operation will affect the sign of the result. So there are several cases. And uh, if your tool is flexible enough, you will be able to encode this exceptions into the checking of Misra rule 10.1, which means that you will pass from 100,000 violation exam to 23. And, and you can then focus on the remaining ones, on the ones that are potentially unsafe, and, and, uh, and actually find uh, ways of improving the code. So here is, is, here is an example. So is what uh, was present uh, in uh, uh, in Zen before the MISRA compliance work. And this is a clever trick. So we are taking uh, an unsigned number, which is a line. We are taking the unary minus, and then we end it with the original. So I don't know. How many of you know what this does? Okay. Not all know. And in fact, not all the exam maintainers did know. Some of them say, oh yeah, this is obvious. This isolates the least significant bit, but some of them didn't. So uh, the way which we improved the code, we uh, encapsulated this into a macro. The macro has a name and a, some documentation that explains what it does. And then we can globally deviate rule 10.1 for this macro and for all other places where we violate rule 10.1, but this is intentional, we have a reason, it is well documented, and so nobody will be mistaken by some code like this, which might seem, uh, uh, which is actually obscure, okay? This, uh, well, it, it's a big trick which works uh, and it, it's not trivial to understand why it works. Another example. Uh, there are MISRA guidelines that are perceived as being too restrictive. So one is rule 16.3. It says an unconditional break statement shall terminate every switch clause. And the reason is that you don't want to fall through without being aware you are falling through. So if there is not a break statement, maybe you have forgotten it, or maybe it was intentional. Okay, however, uh, there are other things that you can use instead of, uh, instead of uh, the um, uh, break to express this intentionality that, that equally well express the intentionality. For example, you can end it with a go to or with a return. Or uh, if you have uh, some functions that uh, are declared with a no return function specifier in C11, then you can say, hey, well, that's panic. So I don't need to place a return after it because panic will never return. It has been declared as such, okay? So again, this requires tool configurability. Uh, if you take, a, if you use a MISRA checking tool that is not configurable enough, uh, then you will have to deal with many, many more violations that uh, if you can incorporate this kind of uh, motivated and documented exception. This is very interesting. Conditional compilation via kconfig because it uh, affects uh, uh, Linux and all the things that were spawned by Linux in one way or another or that inherited the, the programming style and, uh, and the technology. Uh, which includes Zephyr and Zen, so it's k-config uh, um, for managing quite complex configurations. So um, in the, the MISRA compliant way of doing with configuration is using the preprocessor. So if something is not 
meant to be present in a certain configuration, you compile it away using the preprocessor. And this is important because uh, it's also a, a measure for security. You don't want the excluded code to be present in the device. If the device, uh, if, the, if unwanted code ends up in the device, then chances are someone may exploit the presence of the code, okay? may find a way of jumping into the disabled code. So this is the reason why Misra C says that uh, you have to use the preprocessor to exclude code. But this is not in line with the practice of Linux, Zephyr, and Zen. And, and actually, Linux, Zephyr, and Zen, they say, don't use the preprocessor to exclude code. And they have good reasons because uh, the nesting ends up well, the indentation ends up well, but most importantly, if you use a preprocessor in highly configurable projects like Linux, for example, how many configurations do you have? Infinite number. And some combination of configuration will be compiled one day by a guy in Oklahoma that probably has never been tried before. And at that point, if you use this, technology, it's very likely you will end up with a compilation error. The code will not compile. Nobody has tried that combination of macros. So whereas if you use kconfig, and so you will use uh, this, uh, oh, okay, yeah. You use this instead of the preprocessor, then all the code is checked at every compilation. And the risk of ending up with something that in certain configuration doesn't even compile it's, uh, it's lower, so you have less chances of breaking the build. Of course, well, maybe the code that was never enabled doesn't work, but at least uh, uh, it, uh, it, it builds. So, um, so there is these two competing view, and uh, they are not uh, in uh, contrast to a point that there is nothing we can do. Uh, there are reasons for both. So the... Uh, decision that was taken uh, by Xen and for which we had to update the tool. Our tool was not supporting this possibility because it's a compromise, okay? So there is nothing in the C standard that says that if you have code with if zero, that the compiler will remove it. In fact, the compiler should not remove it if you jump inside it from outside. So if you have if zero and then a piece of code and there is a label and you can jump it, the compiler should not remove it. So the Xen project decided to uh, have the extra burden of making sure that the compiler they use with the options they use will remove the code excluded by if with a compile time, con uh, an integer um, compile time constant evaluating to zero, okay? They have to be sure. So this uh, means that uh, they will have to make further checks on the compiler, okay? which is good anyway, it would have been impossible for them to stop using kconfig and using the preprocessor, okay? And about the, the thing of uh, jumping inside an if zero, if zero uh, guarded uh, construct, uh, if you comply to other MISRA guidelines, this will, not this will be impossible. So the two things together, the three things together, so you use kconfig, you qualify the compiler to ensure that the compiler and the way you use it uh, will uh, remove the, the code that is guarded by if zero and MISRA compliance to the rules that prevent you from jumping inside the block. This uh, will achieve uh, the same result uh, of the MISRA guideline and it will be perfectly compatible with MISRA. So the lessons uh, learned, uh, we have time, as we are still five minutes, so uh, it's okay. Um, uh, the lesson learned and uh, during this project, actually before this project, we were involved in a project uh, concerning the Zephyr real-time operating system. So we have built on this and uh, the, on existing code of high quality and uh, 
and Xen is of high quality and Zephyr is of high quality. You can expect more deviation, but the potential of MISRA for suggesting improvement is still very high. Uh, thanks to the MISRA compliance effort, we, we and, and Xen maintainers and the Xen people, we have found a, a certain number of bugs of errors and one of this it's now currently under embargo so i cannot tell you about this until the 24th of september but it's not pointless so and in fact these weekly meetings we had with maintainers they started in one way and then now people are really on the same page so they realize the value of of this uh, because uh, um yeah we have also made the training, uh, MISRA training for them before starting, before starting the project. Another thing is that there is interdependencies. Uh, MISRA guidelines are interdependent, uh, interdependent as I said a few minutes uh, before. So um, the, the guidelines that prevent you from jumping inside the block, they are instrumental for you to deviate the other, the other guidelines that would say, hey, you have to use a preprocessor to uh, to um, do your uh, configuration uh, management of the source code, okay? And then tool configurability is extremely important because uh, especially on open source software and, uh, and we, when we have uh, established the practices that make a lot of sense from the code quality point of view, you want to be able to tailor MISRA to follow them because it is completely impractical to force them to, say, fix things that need not be fixing because they are safe, okay, in, in, in the very large majority, and also that they cannot fix because they are in the tens or hundreds of thousands. So you have to be able to, to tailor the rules, not just on paper, but the tool, okay? Continuous integration is crucial uh, for uh, in particular for open source software where you have a, a diverse and distributed uh, uh, community and also, uh, yeah, you need to lighten the burden of maintainers. So now the maintainers of Xen can count on a um, continuous, in, continuous in integration tool chain where every patch that is submitted is counted for MISRA compliance and it will be blocked if uh, the MISRA rules that are already clean, so with zero violations, are violated. So this is also uh, essential. And also, uh, the, on the relationship between MISRA and open source software, at the beginning, it might be difficult. For example, reconciling the attitude towards virtuoso programming, which is uh, one of the distinguishing factors of many open source uh, um, project and also the more uh, code has to be dumb and easy to follow, followed by MISRA. But in the end, if the initial resistance is, uh, uh, is uh, um, came over by open discussion and, and then the, 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 the results that can be attained are very high quality. I'm, really proud of what we did for, for Xen, for example, because it happens in a lot of cases that the interaction was fruitful. So the resistance of one maintainer said no, because code is correct in this way. They suggested the things to tailor the MISRA guidelines that we didn't think before and that we incorporate into the tool and, and and the result was very high quality. And then also the other way around. So insist so some of the maintainers, so all the maintainers, I think, they have, they have changed their mind tower, tower Misra and, uh, and they are now are look more, much more carefully at, at the violation because they have uh, completely uh, figured out what the contribution is uh, uh, towards code quality. So bringing an existing code base into MISA compliance uh, is known to be difficult, risky, and time consuming. I'm not saying it is not, okay? It is something that requires time and dedications and, and resources. In the, in the case of Xen, the resources were 
put into place largely by AMD, but also uh, from the entire development community. And sometimes this is uh, a necessity. So you want to use a certain piece of software. You don't want to rewrite from scratch and you need to use it in a safety, in safety related development. So you have to do it. And uh, it requires a lot of experience and, and also training tailoring and tooling. So training means that you need to have at least the key people in the project completely aligned and they have to understand what MISRA uh, is uh, uh, asking and why it is asking. Tailoring is uh, what I've uh, talked about uh, in the past uh, 15 minutes and also good tooling because otherwise uh, there is no way that the tailoring can have any practical, any practical value. So uh, um, we have presented uh, some of the issues that uh, we have faced and what we have learned during the work on the Xen hypervisor project and also in, on other similar projects. And uh, notice that this presentation is only a small part of the entire thing. There is a paper and uh, if you go to Baxang page on LinkedIn, you will find the link to the paper in this morning post, but also I have shared the paper, I don't know if it works, but in the, on the SCAD uh, thing, there is uh, uh, the slides and the paper. So my suggestion, if you are interested, please read the paper because uh, a lot of material is, is, uh, is only there and not in the presentation. Okay, thanks. If you have uh, questions, I will be, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, very, very nice presentation. And actually, it's very interesting. Um, so I was wondering, I, I mean, I think that probably what's been done for Zen would be also uh, pretty, in, pretty interesting for, uh, for, uh, for Linux, like, for example, for the Linux kernel, because, you know, um, in, indeed, you know, the Linux kernel is not MISRA compliant and you know fixing all the violation is nearly uh, impossible however if there's if there was a tailoring of the uh, checkers if you like then maybe we could you know shrink down the the actual violation to be analyzed uh, to a subset that maybe is manageable uh, so my question is now with respect to this work that's been done for zen are, is the uh, is the tailoring of the checkers like publicly available or it isn't? What do you mean by mm, publicly available? Um, I mean uh, in a in publication. The, no, like the I think so. The Zen Advisor is uh, a Linux Foundation project. Yeah. Right? Also. I think there is a special interest group for to, to make it safe. Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe I understand the question. Yeah, yeah. so there is one, uh, one uh, uh, the, the thing is maintained. So in the Xen Git repository, there is a place uh, which is under doc, I think, which is called uh, uh, misrep.rst, where all the deviations we have approved uh, are uh, written. Okay. So the, the, the deviations that were made, they are uh, available and, and uh, you can see them today uh, by looking at, uh, uh, at the project itself. Okay, so the, the deviations to the... Yeah, yeah. The okay. deviations are public because uh, this is uh, actually one of the, of the things that makes me unsure about whether the same thing can be done for Linux. So it's... Uh, it depends on the relationship you have on, on upstream. So in Xen, uh, 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 upstream uh, people is completely aligned with the desire of making Xen certifiable and actually certifying it for some configuration. And, and uh, I don't know if, if Linux uh, can be similar, so. It depends, I, I mean, my experience is that Indeed, you know, maintainers are kind of uh, maybe pissed off by, you know, false positive. Yeah. But, if, you know, if there is a way to, let's say, to, to remove, to filter such false positive and, you know, find out actual, you know, yeah. bugs, then 
I'm sure that maintainers will be pretty interested. So yeah, yeah. One thing that uh, maybe is doable um, is to. Um, Where is it? No, I don't want this. Um, accept. So let's see. Uh, there is uh, Linux Next here. And uh, we have a configuration where we have we are using a small selection of uh, the Misra guide, a very small selection, and uh, we have 53,000 uh, violation. And uh, yeah, so yeah. And one thing I, I was thinking that one thing that maybe uh, we could do would be to uh, use exactly exactly the same uh, uh, deviations used for the Xen project on Linux uh, and, uh, and see what happens. And uh, this, uh, this might be interesting. Yeah. yeah that, that can be probably a starting point and uh, maybe a baseline for uh, a plumber's presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank there was you. Actually, I had exactly the same question, so yeah. I'm just continuing with that. Uh, the challenge is not just a MISRA compliance. However, there's de definitely a significant involvement from maintainer, and Stefano and the maintainers were involved accepting those changes yeah. from the coding style, pers coding style perspective, not just for, for a MISRA uh, tailoring. So that is the challenge I see for Linux and yeah. yeah. So without involvement uh, from maintainers, it would yes. be hard. Yes. Uh, yeah, but, but maybe maybe this can be done. Uh, I don't know. After selecting the subset of Linux uh, that is, uh, you need you need to select a small uh, uh, configuration, maybe, and you have some to have some interest. Uh, so in in the case of Xen, it was AMD. AMD was willing to spend uh, money and resources in getting the, the job done. And, and so this, is, this was a trigger. Yeah. Plus, I mean, apart getting the job done, maybe, you know, if a maintainer has a good reason for a certain code style, you know, the, I remember the top of the presentation, there was a sentence saying, you know, the, the goal of Mistra is to improve quality, right? Yeah, So basically. Exactly. If there is a good reason for a certain code style, then you know it could be possible, you know, to to add one more deviation, and then we move on. So, yeah. see what. So the next, uh, the next, uh, I think, important project that uh, is uh, um, embracing uh, the Mesa coding standard is Zephyr. So. Uh, Zephyr is a, at a quite advanced stage of, uh, uh, we had working on a, on a branch, uh, on a develop, oh, sorry, on a, on a stable branch of Zephyr, uh, uh, it was two years ago, and now the, the changes uh, are being, uh, are being uh, ported uh, to the main development trunk, and also a continuous integration pipeline is, is being put um, in place these days actually these days, uh, to uh, 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 do MISR compliance checks at every pull request. Yeah. Based on my experience, it has always been very difficult. I have probably fought 
a lot of uh, repos, open source repos at this point and make them compliant with uh, outboarding standards. What is the standard practice? Like, is what I am seeing, is that a, a unique case or are maintainers usually more open to uh, adopting uh, some of these standards? I mean, I know I got a couple of examples, <laughs> but in general, in general, I don't know. What I what I know from experience is that there is a lo there is a lot of difference uh, from uh, before the training and after the training. So before the training, the thing can can go awful in minutes. Oh, this rule is so stupid! I will not look at Miser again in my life. And then. And then uh, you say, wait a minute, uh, so there is a rationale. Uh, let me explain you the rationale. So, and in some cases, uh, you may find people that didn't know about undefined behavior or unspecified behavior, or uh, maybe they had the misconception about the C language. And, uh, and then um, uh, after the training, the attitude changes completely. And uh, one of the things that is very important to eradicate from the mind of people is that uh, uh, Misra is a list of prohibitions. So, Misra is very pragmatic, and uh, everything uh, uh, it has to be done in the best, uh, as in the best engineering uh, engineering uh, tradition. So, it's uh, a dialogue between peers. So, uh, the thing has to be safe and provably safe. So, it's never uh, it's it's like this because I say it, you have to prove it to someone else and uh, maybe to an assessor. And also, when the assessor arrives, this is a good moment where the attitude changes. For example, uh, concerning recursion. Hey, but I uh, will know, but it's so convenient to use recursion here. Okay, yes, but the stack space is limited. Can you give me the maximum depth of recursion? for all the configuration you want to have to qualify. And when they realize I don't have an answer, they change attitude. They say, okay, I will rewrite the code to make it uh, iterative instead of recursive. Yeah. Okay, I think we have over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you.